Welcome, everyone. Today's episode of Walk on Perspective features Auburn long snapper Jacob Quaddlebaum. Before getting into the interview, I wanted to acknowledge today's episode is being brought to you by Walk on Wellness. If you are a busy professional or a parent looking to get your vitality, your focus, your energy levels back to be able to keep up with your kids, be the best version of yourself, maybe you're just looking to lose between 20 to 40 pounds without sacrificing endless hours in the gym, on the treadmill, and eating crazy restricted diets, I encourage you to DM me, Robert, at walkonperspective.com and learn about how we can possibly pair with you to put together an individualized plan for nutrition and exercise programming catered to your specific goals, your body type, and help you with overall body composition and overall energy levels. Again, today's episode is being brought to you by Walk On Wellness. Without further ado, I am excited to bring you today's episode. Welcome everyone to Walk On Perspective. I am your host, Robert Boswell. Thank you to each and every one of you who tunes in each and every week. Nobody covers the Walk On profile like we do here at Walk On Perspective. And today, I cannot be more excited to bring to you yet another inspirational Walk On success story at Auburn. Jacob, I want you to tell us a little bit about yourself. Hey, yeah. Um, so I'm now the fifth year senior walk on long snapper, which has earned a scholarship at this point at Auburn University. This is my second year being the full time starter. And this is my third actually uh, kind of filling in after an injury earlier as uh, a starter got injured earlier. in My career got a little experience there, but this is my second year full time starting at Auburn. Awesome. So give us an idea. First, first and foremost, let's uh, even before Auburn, let's tell our listeners a little bit about yourself. Where are you from? Uh, did you grow up having any allegiances to a college football program? Uh, give us the full rundown. Yeah, so I'm originally from Enterprise, Alabama. It's a small town, military town in South Alabama, and kind of grew up as an Auburn fan. You know, started coming to Auburn games before I can even remember. Um, family raised me right in the orange and blue. So, uh, yeah, uh, started back in Enterprise, Alabama, and kind of grew um, the dream, and is, I'm now living that dream out. So, I know, what was your earliest exposure to football? Did you play peewee ball, or was, was it until, what, middle school, high school that you started actually focusing on football? Yeah, so I played, I played peewee football, peewee baseball, pretty much anything, you know, sports-related I could – get into I played growing up uh for probably my first introduction to football was you know peewee football and um just kind of grew my love of the game there was never really you know parents pushed me to just be the best I could and um never really you know it wasn't one of those burnout effects or anything like that where they're just pushing me pushing me um they it was all for me, for the love of the game that I played anything that I did. So kind of growing up, uh, Pee Wee football is where I got started. And then um, kind of going into, you know, that early middle school eight, kind of age range where you start getting introduced to, you know, formal coaches, you know, middle school coaches that are trying to get you ready for high school is where I really started to pick up, you know, what I do here at Auburn now, which is long snapping. Um, probably seventh or eighth grade, I was uh, – I was playing center at Dolphin Junior High School in Enterprise, and our coach, Mark Seaving, uh, you know, we needed a long snapper, and he, he said, you know, you're already the center. You already snap at five yards with one hand. Let's, you know, let's put a second hand on there, and let's go to 15 yards and just see how you can do. And, um, you know, never really heard of long snappers before. We, we try to stay unknown to the public, um, just do our job and everything. So we hadn't really heard of it at that time in my career. And, you know, really found that craft that I was I was good at. Um, I had a couple other coaches along the way, Carson Francis, who was a snapper at Middle Tennessee State back in the 90s and 80s. Um, he he was from Enterprise and he he kind of he taught me at a young age, the very basics. And then growing up through high school, I uh, I wasn't I wasn't per se the most athletic guy on the team, but I was always the best at throwing the ball 15 yards between my legs and. 
going to camps from Cole's kicking, punting, snapping camps to come to Auburn to showcase my abilities and just compete with other guys that are, that are doing it. Um, and so, yeah, that's a little bit about my background snapping and just kind of, you know, blossoming it into what I do now at Auburn. Okay. You had mentioned you, you played a, a lot of sports as a youth and then even into middle school and high school. Is it safe to say, was football always your primary passion or were you more of a basketball or baseball guy? No, actually, baseball for the longest time was my passion. I I always wanted to be a, a, a first baseman in the major leagues and um, that kind of grew into middle school and then into high school a little bit. And, you know, once I got into high school, I realized uh, football was going to be more my path to go to succeed and long snapping was going to be kind of where I, where I found that, uh, that niche and kind of, uh, and really gave me an opportunity to play at Auburn to further my athletic career and just stay, stay in the game. What position did you play in baseball? I was a corner infielder and then a pitcher sometimes every once in a while. Do you feel like that background pitching helped you in any way uh, with, with long snapping? Because both just require such uh, a, a particular niche kind of hand feel for ball control and the way that you spin it. Obviously, it's completely different weight and shape and the way that you do it. But do you feel like just having that that proprioception or that, that motor control with your hands being able to manipulate a ball? Do you feel like that helped you? Absolutely. I you know, like you said, they're very similar, but also very different. And it's it's all about hitting a target. So for me, in long snapping, I'm always aiming at the right hip of our punter. In baseball pitching, that was always wherever the, you know, the glove, wherever we called the pitch, you know, you had to hit that spot. Um, so, yes, very different styles, but also, you know, very different or very similar philosophies kind of when you when you break it down. A lot of long snapping guys, Jacob, that I've met with and that I've talked to, they're they're all almost obsessive to the point of, of the way that they take care of their hands. We had an opportunity to have Morgan Cox, a uh, Super Bowl champion and five-time Pro Bowler for the Tennessee Titans, current long snapper there. And he talked about how uh, he he never uses hand lotion of any kind. He doesn't use hand sanitizer uh, when, when uh, he washes his hands. He, he makes sure uh, he takes extra care not to do anything that's going to soften his hands. He wants that that calloused type hands for that extra firm grip on the ball, particularly in poor weather games. Are, are you obsessive about your hand and how you take good care of it? <laughs> Absolutely. I, you know, I've never really thought about it as obsessive. Just it's always been natural for me just to I like my hands feeling a certain way when they go on the football. Um, so yeah, I guess you could say I do. I know, you know, especially when we get into cold weather games, I, you know, I won't touch, uh, lotion or anything like that. Won't get near it. Um, you know, if, if, it, especially if it's cold and I need, you know, whatever to be put on my skin, if it's lotion or if it's, you know, or it's whatever it may be. I always have an athletic trainer that has to do it for me. And, you know, I, I avoid it all possible. You know, I'm very particular about the certain type of towels I use in games, as well as the uh, if if I need a hand warmer, you know, what that what the inside of that hand warmer feels like. It's just it's very weird. But at the same time, it's uh, it's very I'm very particular about it. For people who maybe haven't played football or haven't followed it closely or, or don't pay particular attention to that portion of the game talk to us about the difference in the game balls because there's obviously balls that you kick balls that you throw with as a snapper and somebody who has to have complete control of the ball that you are rifling backwards while hanging suspended upside down <laughs> talk to us about the difference between a kicking ball versus a ball that is going to be used in the passing game you know, in college, a lot of the times we use quarterback balls to kick in games just simply because we can't get that kicking ball out on the field, whether it be the refs don't allow it in or just the play happens so quickly and they just spot the ball. And, you know, you you would love to have that kicking ball. And the kicking ball typically um, 
when you have a quarterback ball, it's very, uh, you know, it's narrow. It works with the quarterbacks. It's easy to throw for them and catch for the receivers, tight ends, whoever it may be. King ball is usually a little bit, uh, a little bit thicker of a ball. I don't, I don't know the good way to put it a little more round and uh, bloated, I guess you could say that really comes off the punter's foot, uh, punter or kicker's foot as good as possible, or, um, you know, they can drive through that ball and it'll, um, it'll carry, but in the game, you know, you never really know which ball you're going to get because, you know, there's so many factors that go into it, whether it be, like I said, refs or, you know, the play happens and they call us out to go quickly onto the field. You know, we want a quick punt or we want a quick field goal. Um, but it's it's that ability ability to adjust on the fly. You know, I, I can kind of look down at the ball when I get over it and see, you know, am I working with the kicking ball or am I working with a quarterback ball that's going to be a little more stiff, a little a little narrower, a little probably a little more a little stickier um, with that grip they put on it or how they mud it or, you know, you can kind of tell by just looking at it. And at that point, nothing really changes with my grip. It's just I've got to think about, hey, got to follow through on this one, really work on that release. Do you in any way have to change your hand positioning or your mechanics or the force that you grip the football with, depending upon which ball is out there? Because like you mentioned, there are times when you're not sure which ball you're going to have to be snapping, whether it's a quarterback ball or a kicking ball, depending upon what the refs will allow you to get in. A little bit. It's it's more of uh, how firm I grip it. If it's a very sticky ball, I'll probably won't have as much pressure on it. Uh, just simply because I don't want I don't want to pull the snap or I don't want to you know snap it high just simply because my hands get stuck on it. I normally don't change where my hand placement is unless you know the biggest difference is how I place my hands for field goal snaps compared to punt snaps. Um, I you know field goal snaps you're very particular about hitting the same spot every time on the holder as well as having the laces forward so your kicker never sees or has to deal with those. Um, and really punt, the hand placement's going to be the same every time. But if it's, you know, a little bit stickier, like I said, or has a different type of mudding on it than what the K-ball has, um, I'll, I'll adjust pr the pressure I have on the ball. Now, you had mentioned there, Jacob, about the importance of making sure that your rotation is the exact same every time so that when it arrives at the holder for a, a, a field goal or a place kick – the laces are positioned forward so that it doesn't mess up the kicker. Now on punts, is there is there anything that you try to do to make sure that the laces end up in any particular spot in the punter's hands, or you're just trying to get it back there in in as fast as you possibly can? Um, I don't think there's a personally, I don't worry about the laces for the punters simply because there's so many factors that go into that 15 yards, whether it be you have a wind or maybe a sight rain or, you know, whatever the case may be, it's very hard to control the same laces for that distance and, you know, and keep it steady for the punter. So they, they've got a good job with their, they've got to do a good job with their hands as well. Just kind of getting the balls how they like it. And um, I just try to put it in the same spot every time. So even if he does have to adjust the laces slightly, you know, it's it's an easy catch, an easy turn for him to get the ball off. Jacob, do you have a preference on snapping for punting versus field goals? Because I can see advantages to both, right? Because if you're on the field for, say, a game, a game winning or a game tying field goal and you're part of that that unit that ends up winning the game in massive elation, I can also see, you know, on punts, you know, if you get that thing back there and then you're you're smoking down the field on on kick coverage and then are able to make a tackle. I mean, that's pretty cool too. I, do you have a preference of either one? Not really. If I had to pick one, I'd probably i I like the uh, the preciseness of field goals, I guess, better. But honestly, I just love being out there. Um, I'm a student of the game. I love studying, you know, punt return teams as well as. Um, our field goal block teams that we're going to go against. Um, but I guess if I had to choose one, I, I love how every, how precise everything has to be in, uh, in a field goal scenario. I come from a, so here at Auburn, I studied engineering and everything's very technical and everything's very precise. So I guess it would kind of fall back to that.
I was going to get into that as far as what your studies were there at Auburn. And it's fascinating coming from an engineering background with the the specialization of what you do on a football field, because, I mean, you talk about the rotation, the the velocity, the, the pendulum motion that you're using. How much do you feel like just having an engineering background and the way that you think has helped you from a mechanics standpoint, particularly with uh, something in football that requires being exactly the same every single time you do it? Yeah, so I think going back to the engineering background, you're very detail-oriented, and you have to be with snapping as well. It's finding those precise, you know, small little minute things that you can get better at. Um, or in an engineering standpoint, it's finding those those small little parts or small, you know, whatever it may be to make your product. Or, you know, for me, I was in electrical engineering. It's making sure all those circuit boards or, you know, the wiring, everything's precise when you're, you know, working with, a radio circuit compared to a robotic circuit or you know uh, whatever that may be very general terms there and it's uh it's very being very detail oriented and and um and you know precise with all your calculations or on a football field being precise about all your like hand placements or rotation of the football or you know how my body's moving that day i need to adjust for this whatever it may be i can't possibly imagine how many times you have to snap a football during the off season fall camp and then even during the season in practice settings but i am curious on average, do you have an idea of, say, during a game? Because you see the, the the kicking guys over there always making sure that they are ready at a moment's notice, being able to go in and, and warm up. How many snaps would you say you're taking in over on the sideline just in, in between moments during the game? You know, I, I'm somebody who doesn't have to have a lot of snaps during the game. Typically, I'm I'm sitting on the bike, just make, keeping my legs warm, keeping just – staying moving don't get stiff or kind of avoiding that um that point where i'm just you know sitting still and you know hamstrings are getting tight whatever it may be i might get three or four snaps when we're on offense just to make sure i'm feeling good the ball's being placed right you know everything looks good but other than that usually i'm just either on the bike or i'm you know supporting my teammates however that may be so i'm not a in practice during the week, you know, coming up to the game, I'm a reps guy. I get tons of snaps, but on game day, I, I kind of trust myself and um, just make sure my body's loose and I, I'm feeling good. I guess, Jacob, this is a question more for just the specialist unit as a whole, not just specifically for the long staffing position. You see almost at every level of football, high school, college, and in the professional ranks where – if there's a moment either at the end of a half or the end of a game to kick a field goal, even if it's not in a game winning type uh, type play, if the other team has timeouts, they will quote unquote, try and ice the kicker and you'll see them try and strategically time it sometimes right up to where they're actively snapping the football and then kicking what is going to be in effect a, a practice kick. Do you, like having that does it psych you out in any way I, I feel like it has to be an advantage to the kicking team if they were quote unquote iced and then had an opportunity to just go through the motions of what is going to be in real time yeah so ha I try to avoid looking at the scoreboard a lot of the game um you know keeping up with down distances I, I have to just to make sure I'm ready to go and in the right place. But timeouts wise, you know, our kicker might be different, but personally, I don't look at it. I go out there like everything's going to be normal. And, you know, if they call that timeout, great. We get another shot at it. If not, hey, we we are going to go out there and operate like it's like it's no different. I I try to avoid, you know, being a scoreboard watcher, trying to keep up with things like that, just simply because. I want to be in the game and I want to focus on what I need to focus on when I get down there and not worry about, hey, are they going to call a timeout or, you know, 
is something going to be different this rep or, hey, are we going to have to be out here twice, three times, whatever it may be, however many timeouts they have. Um, a lot of what I'm focusing on is just simply the operation of the field goal or punt or whatever it may be. And uh, I try to avoid, you know, the outside noise, I guess you could say, of, hey, in the half, they're probably going to call a timeout here. Try to avoid it. Like, I, I'm i very much, hey, the snap's going to be here. I'm going to grip the ball like this. That's going to rotate one and a half times before it gets to the holder. The laces are going to be forward. I got a block. This guy's going to swim move to the right of me. He's He's a cross face guy rather than a, you know, a, a straight a gap pressure or try to drive through the gap. I that's kind of what's going through my mind compared to, hey, there's a timeout. They might call it. You know, during the off season, especially when fall camp rolls around, I know that with the technology available, especially at places like at Auburn, uh, so much of what you do is, is down to timing. And there are metrics where you can you can measure the velocity of the ball on your snap and then get a very precise time from from the point of the snap to where it hits the holder in the hands. I, I was curious because this is something that I, I just didn't know if they were currently utilizing during the season when you were doing film work, studying your previous reps in the previous game, is there any metrics that you use in film study to see the velocity during a game? Or is that really just something that you only can truly know when you have everything available to you, say, in a, at like a fall camp setting? We typically will measure our, you know, snap times, our operation times, and stuff like that. Not typically velocity of the ball, but we uh, we we do it at all times, whether it be from, you know, a summer rep that we want to get filmed or a fall camp rep or even in games. You know, everything is going to be measured just to keep us on point, to make sure we're doing everything that we're supposed to, and it's translating from off-season training the fall camp preseason to in games we're not changing anything everything is how it should be how we practiced it so our op times typically we we sit around one two five operation time which is you know a second and a quarter um that that really we feel is our kickers are moving at a good pace at that point the snaps on point of that you know to the holder the holder's getting it down and there's no chance and an outside rusher can get to the block point on a field goal. So that's typically where we try to be around. And it's it's give or take a couple hundredths of seconds. On punt, we're under two second operation time. And that's typically we sit around, you know, one nine to two seconds, um, depending on what punt type we're using, whether it be a rollout style rugby punt or, or whether that's a standard, you know, pocket punt, the snap's gonna be about, you know, seven tenths of a second. And that way the punter has about 1.3 seconds to get that punt off and he has plenty of time to go about his you know do what he needs to do while he's back there and you know whether that be taking his steps properly or he's got to rotate the ball because the laces were down or um, just hit a clean punt behind the shield um, so yeah we measure all of that from you know spring practices to you know summer workouts when we are out there by ourselves we'll have a we'll have an ipad out there filming our reps and we'll have you know, one of our other specialists are off to the side that aren't in the rep, you know, with a stopwatch going to fall camp. We have it on film and we have our analysts and graduate assistants that are, you know, tracking everything we do. And then to end game, we we go back and, you know, on Sundays, we like the specialist group ourselves will go in there and we'll sit there for an hour just talking about techniques. Hey, this is what I did on this rep or you know, hey, we were a little slow on this off time. We got it. We can't have that happen um, because you can see the outside pressure is coming. We got it off, but hey, we, we need to be a little bit faster. Or, you know, we were a little quick on this rep. Let's, you know, don't, you know, just kind of stay back there calm and do what we need to do. I really appreciate, Jacob, you 
kind of going down this road with us. Uh, so much of what you do is so technical. And as a nerd and, and a student of the game, I, I truly um, really appreciate everything that goes into that uh, specialist unit. So thank you. I know we kind of got off track there. Let's back up a moment. I do want to go back uh, to high school for a moment and just kind of talk about the recruiting process and how you did end up at Auburn. You, you had mentioned that you grew up an Auburn fan, growing up there in Alabama, uh, had likely experienced several big time atmospheres. I want to know, as a specialist, obviously, when you're trying to gain exposure and figure out what your next destination is going to be. I mean, you're, you're, you're camping everywhere. I mean, that's the biggest thing with specialists is you just got to get in front of as many different people as you can. You got to kind of time it right to see like who is going to have a need for the position at the time, who's graduating, who's not, where is going to be a likely destination where I can end up earning a scholarship. Who's going to give me a preferred walk on opportunity. Give us an idea as you started to really find your niche in high school and, and realize that long snapping was going to be your inevitable place on a college roster. Talk to us about the recruiting process. Who were you speaking to at the time? Where, if any camps were you going to? And then ultimately what was what was the deciding factor of why Auburn was just right for you and for your family? Yeah. So early on in high school, I think probably talking with my family, my dad and I, we, we spent hours in the backyard practicing and sometimes even arguing over snapping techniques and, you know, what I'm doing right, what I'm doing wrong and really figuring out, Hey, this is something I can do. We originally started going to Cole's, Jamie Cole's kicking, punting, and long snapping camps, which is a national brand. They do the ESPN rankings and everything like that. And, you know, learning from them and kind of figuring out what that process is um, really benefited me early on, probably, you know, freshman, sophomore year of high school is when I started to figure all this out. And they, they kind of helped me explain, you know, hey, you need to, you need to get in front of coaches. They're not going to take a guy unless they see you pretty much. So, after my junior year, so between junior and senior year, I went to probably 11 or 12 college specialist camps, just trying to get in front of as many coaches as possible, mainly all in the southeast and uh, SEC schools, Sunbelt schools, you know, UAB and Birmingham, so Conference USA or whoever it was, um, I was trying to get in front of them just to get an opportunity. So. After that summer, heard back from a couple of coaches and they said, hey, we're interested. We just, you know, you have to get accepted in the school, especially as a walk on. You, you know, you're not you're not going to be on scholarship. Most everybody was preferred walk on spot. So, you know, there were a lot of openings, which is a great thing. Um, but a lot of it was preferred walk ons. And I was happy with that. You know, I was I had a roster spot pretty much. Um, so getting accepted to schools and. Um, after really talking over talking it over with my family and you know Auburn was one of those schools that was pretty late in the process um, to to kind of figuring out where I wanted to go and you know Auburn was always a dream of mine to to attend and to play football so probably you know spring of my senior year I hadn't made a decision yet and um Auburn originally had a snapper coming here in 2018, um, but he he backed out and ended up getting offered a scholarship elsewhere, which opened up a spot and got a call from the uh, the walk ons coach uh, or our high school liaison for Auburn. And, you know, he told me there was going to be a spot. And that he'd love to have me on the team. And at that point, you know. It was, you know, a, kind of a dream come true there. So it was a. Uh, it was just everything kind of fell into place late on, later on in the process. And um, it was getting to that point where I was about to have to make a decision on where I was going to go. And it, it just ended up being perfect timing. And um, I, I came to Auburn, you know, I originally thought I was, you know, possibly was going to maybe try out for Auburn, even if I didn't get a spot, if I did decided, you know, I didn't really want to go to anywhere else. Um, but luckily they called and, I got a uh, got a roster spot. Surprised my parents with it, um, just because I got a call in my my personal cell uh, from the coach, and uh, later on that day was able to surprise my parents with it. And we were all, um, you know, happy go lucky. Um, just it was a great time, and ended up getting to Auburn uh, in fall camp. 
uh, and really just from there, it was all about the work. Sounds like everything leading up to arriving at Auburn was just a dream come true. There have been moments during your five years at Auburn where you've experienced the highest of highs and also some lows in there. There are few across college football who are still currently playing who can boast that they have played for three different head coaches during their stint at one school without transferring you have done that uh, you started out uh, playing for coach Gus Malzon, and then when he was let go they brought in coach Brian Harson, and then things didn't turn out uh, obviously the way uh, he and the rest of your team had hoped uh, he was relieved of his duties earlier this year and the interim head coach uh, Cadillac Williams or Carnell Williams uh, it was announced just a few weeks ago. You have now played for three different head coaches. I, I have to imagine going into your tenure at Auburn, you never would have imagined that being the case, right? No, to say this has been a whirlwind is to say the least. Uh, I, you know, came to Auburn and it was Coach Gus Malzahn, and I have the utmost respect for Coach Malzahn and Coach Harson, as well as uh, Coach Cadillac. Um, but we also had Coach Steele in there as an interim head coach. So this is – I'm actually on my fourth oh, that's head right. Coach so, uh, it has been a very up-and-down process from, you know, 2018, 2019 with Coach Malzahn to 2020, 2021, and so on. Or, you know, we've had those those great seasons, you know, with Derek Brown, Marlon Davidson, Jarrett Stidham, Will Hastings, those type of guys. And, you know, 2019 in the Iron Bowl, I was able to experience something unlike I've ever experienced before. I was um, I was able to play a huge impact in that game with just we got a snap off in less than a second um, to, before the half that ended up leading to a three point win over Alabama in the Iron Bowl to, you know, this this year it's about as low as we could be at, you know, we were three and six coming into this week against Texas A&M and got to experience just a great atmosphere this week and ended up getting a win and, um, you know, just continuing to fight for Coach Cadillac and fight for ourselves and fight for Auburn now um, when we've hit that adversity here at Auburn. And, um, you know, hopefully we'll get another chance next year with this, with uh, whoever the coach may be for a sixth year opportunity to use my COVID year, just to continue to play for Auburn and give everything I have to the school. And um, just because I love Auburn and um, this is, I want to give everything I've got to the, to this place that's given so much to me. Um, so yeah, it's it's been an up and down process, but you know, I can honestly say I I wouldn't trade it. It's it's uh, allowed me to mature and grow into the man I am now, as well as it's uh, it's given me an electrical engineering degree, and now I'm working on my master's um, in business administration. And um, it's just I've had so many opportunities here at Auburn that I wouldn't trade and. Um, you know, even though it's been a lot with uh, with multiple coaches and multiple staffs, um, it's uh, it's it's been a blessing. Gosh, Jacob, a sixth year. That is just crazy. I mean, at this point, I mean, by the end of your sixth year next year, having played for four head coaches, two athletic directors, I mean, is there anybody in Auburn, Alabama that you won't know? I mean, from the hot dog vendor to the parking lot tenant to the physics professor, I mean, you won't be able to go anywhere in that city and not know everyone, right? You know, I've met a lot of people in my five years here, and I'm assuming I'm going to meet even more my sixth year. And so, uh, yeah, it's going to be uh, it's going to be hard to go anywhere without seeing somebody I know. To be honest with you, um, I've been you know I've been taking on many roles here at Auburn, from uh, the academic side of things to leadership organizations, and um, serving as the president of the student athlete advisory committee here at Auburn, getting to meet. Um, administrations from other schools as well as um, as well as here at Auburn from attending SEC conferences to attending you know board events with the president of the university to you know working with professors on different things to the ticketing office <laughs> it's been 
um, it's been really conference wide that I've met people and, you know, here at Auburn, it's, it's hard not to love this place. And especially with building those relationships, um, I, I cherish those relationships that I've made and um, the connections I've made with people. And hopefully, you know, um, I can continue growing those and continue to meet, you know, as many people as I can while I'm here and just connect. We were joking, but uh, it, there's an outside possibility that if indeed they do name a new head coach uh, sometime this off season, they might have to hit you up just to have an idea of w where to look for a house in Auburn, just because, I mean, you, you'll be, you'll be tied into just about every different part of that city. <laughs> I don't know about the housing market. I'm not, I don't know if I'm going to be great at uh, telling them that, but uh, yeah, I know. Every, uh, I, I feel like I know every inch of Auburn just with being here for so long and um, seeing as many things as I've had, as I've seen, um, you know, I, I would love it if he called me up. I wouldn't have a great answer for where to buy a house, but, uh, you know, I, I could sure give him a lot of information about what Auburn's about. One of the really, really cool things that you did get to experience during your tenure at Auburn is what we at Walk On Perspective call the holy grail of Walk On success stories. You were fortunate enough to have earned a scholarship during your time at Auburn. And like with any preferred Walk On opportunity, it's always that kind of wink, wink, nudge, nudge situation where, hey, come in you've got a place on the team uh we could potentially have a scholarship for you at, at you know, maybe at the end of the year or you know as positions come available but it's never guaranteed and that did present itself to you after you had earned that opportunity talk to us about that moment i want to know did you see it coming how was that presented to you how did you break that news to your family and friends and what did that mean as a uh, a young man who had grown up going to games at Jordan, Jordan Hare Stadium, having rolled Tumor's Corner, as you mentioned, bleeds orange and blue. What did that moment mean? You know, it meant it meant so much to me and my family. Uh, it it was like I said, it was a dream come true to play at Auburn, but uh, it was it was icing on top that I was pre presented with a scholarship little background I came in and uh and there was a senior or a uh a starting long snapper already here at Auburn on full scholarship that I was I was uh sitting behind and he got injured his my red shirt freshman year so my second year at Auburn and it presented an opportunity for the second half of the season to be the to be the starter and kind of get a lot of that SEC experience that I I felt I needed later on in my career once he uh, once he graduated and moved on um, so that was early on very beneficial and while I was still a walk on um, while still you know paying for school and doing everything like that I was able to you know experience some of that glory and experience um, you know what it's like to play in the SEC firsthand and then once he came back from injury again I was I was his backup you know I I did everything I could to push him um, because we fully believe competition breeds success here. And um, and so once he came back, all I wanted to do was push him to be the best guy he could be on the field because that was the best thing for the team. And he graduated during 2020 and 2021. I was um, I was given the opportunity to be the full time starter, you know, to be the guy. And I took full advantage of that. I, I gave my everything um, and I still do now that I'm, you know, still a full-time guy. Um, but after, you know, a lot of hours and a lot of uh, hard work, Coach Harson um, was presented me a scholarship um, the Wednesday before the Penn State game of last year. So 2021 week three, I believe, just before we go to Happy Valley for the whiteout game. Coach Harson surprised me after practice um, with that scholarship. And, you know, like I said, it's a true blessing. And it's uh, and it's uh, it's just an honor to see all that hard work pay off after after so many years. And, um, you know, I I really appreciate Coach Harson for for uh, trusting in me with that scholarship. Um, it's kind of funny after he he put me on scholarship, I went to call my parents up and you know, nobody answered, call my sister, nobody answered. And 
I was like, well, um, this is going to be awkward once, you know, they give me a call back in a couple hours or so with whatever they're doing. And they finally call me back after however long of texting them to give me a call. And um, I was able to tell them there. And um, it was to say that it was a surprise on a Wednesday afternoon or Wednesday night. Uh, um, it was definitely a surprise to everybody. And um, we celebrated. Um, and it was just, you know, again, uh, we're very grateful for um, for the chance to be on scholarship because it's uh, it's it's something not many guys to get to experience, especially walk ons. Um, and so, yeah, it's. It's just a true blessing. No doubt. Who had the bigger reaction, mom or dad? I would say, you know, my dad was excited, but my mom, you could tell she was genuinely shocked. Uh, just simply, like I said, the timing and how they were in the middle of doing whatever they were doing at home. Um, and nobody answered me for a couple hours. Um, so mom, I think mom was a little more surprised, had a little more reaction. She was also just upset at herself for not answering the phone earlier. It's interesting. There are few, if, if, if any that get awarded a scholarship during the season. So, I mean, you, you said that you had celebrated, it probably wasn't for long because you probably had practice and film work and morning workouts and not to mention school. And then you got to get ready for the next upcoming opponent. Do you remember what that next game was? Well, the next game was Penn state. So, oh, okay. Right before Penn. Okay. 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 Yes. And that, that was in happy Valley. So, I mean, you're having to, you said it was Wednesday. I mean, y'all are probably getting on a plane Friday, right. To go up to happy Valley. Yeah. So Wednesday so that, afternoon that is when I got the, the scholarship. So the turnaround time is, is I mean, not a whole lot of time to sit there and digest what had just happened. Uh, was there just, was there any difference in your preparation or kind of the way in which you carried yourself after that moment or was it just business as usual business as usual um I still like I said I celebrated that night you know got to hang out with some friends and um, talk with family and just you know enjoyed kind of being around people and getting experience um you know a little just a little fun, you know, putting, putting everything aside for the night and just being like, wow, this, you know, this kind of, this actually happens. Um, and like I said, <laughs> like you said, 6 a.m. workout the next morning comes early. So, uh, you know, went to bed, woke back up the next morning for workout and had to go back to business as usual, preparing for the game. Um, we had, you know, when I got put on scholarship, the one we got on the plane was less than 48 hours. So, uh, yeah got to enjoy it for a night. And then after that, it's back to the work. You know, we have to do everything we can to be prepared for Penn State, especially in, a, in, an, in an environment like a whiteout game is there. Um, it's, uh, yeah, you gotta be business as usual or, or you're not gonna be successful. Football, as you well know, Jacob, is the ultimate team sport, and nobody can have individual success without the help of other people. The offensive line has to block for the quarterback who has to be able to throw it in a timely manner to the wide receivers. They are responsible for getting open. But one could argue that there is is no closer unit on a football field than the specialist unit of uh, it truly – nothing is going to work unless all the different components of the the snap, the hold, the kick, and even on punts, the snap and the punter, I mean, they have to be so incredibly in sync. And it, I would argue that they are probably closer in relationship than any other relationships on a football field, just because of the amount of time that you spend just with each other. There's almost a separate practice that you guys have aside from when the rest of the team is doing, you know, ones versus twos, good on good, uh, situational practice. And you guys are just kind of over there just, just as a unit, just sometimes just the three of you, what, if anything, did you do to celebrate that moment of earning recognition and earning that scholarship with that group, with you, the holder, the punter, the kicker? I mean, they had to have just been incredibly elated for you in that moment, right? 
for sure. You know, those guys are my, I would say my best friends, even outside of football. We spend hours together, you know, every week we go to dinner at least once or twice a week together just to, um, just to be around each other and really grow that trust because when in a special teams unit, everything falls back to trusting guys to do their job. And so, you know, celebrating with those guys, um, it was, it was a, it was a group celebration, you could say, um, just because all of us, it takes, like you said, it takes all of us in that group to, to go through the operation and to be successful. And so just being with those guys, um, in that moment was, uh, was awesome. They, uh, they had my back, you know, no matter what, um, scholarship, no scholarship, whatever's going on, those guys always have my back. And um, just to to celebrate with them and to to see the joy on their faces, probably just as much as the joy on my face uh, was uh, was fun to be around. We had touched on it a moment ago, Jacob, uh, with the timing of this recording we are coming off of Auburn's uh, first win since September. I think I'm right in saying that. And it was against what was a, a preseason top 10 Texas A&M team and what was arguably the the best crowd since that Penn State game that we watched earlier this year. And you would have thought, and Cole Kubelik said it, even on the post-game broadcast, it felt like a playoff atmosphere in that stadium for a, a team that's just fighting for bowl eligibility. And... I, I couldn't believe when I was watching it how exciting the environment felt in a night game. I mean, you would have thought that the stakes were for, you know, anything other than two, three, and six teams going up against each other. But that just goes to show the brotherhood and the family environment that is Auburn football. And I've actually gotten to experience that some myself, both, both as a, a former player going to Jordan-Hare, but then also during the recruiting process. And, and this is, again, this is not about me, but I did want to uh, at least set the stage I, I don't have a relationship with Cadillac Williams, although I have met him. I was 17 years old. I went on a recruiting visit. Coach uh, Tommy Tuberville was the head coach at Auburn at the time. This was in the middle of the 2004 undefeated Auburn season that I like to consider a national championship season because they finished undefeated and uh, just weren't afforded the opportunity back in the BCS area to uh, to play for the national championship. Uh, they, for some reason, the committee thought that, or the computers thought that Oklahoma was deserving, even though they got blown out against USC. Uh, the best team that year, in my opinion, was Auburn, and I continue to call them the national champions that year. But I was there for the Louisiana Tech game. It was home coming got to meet coach tuberville and cadillac williams was on that special team along with rich trucks and uh devin aroma should do and you had guys like uh jake slaughter and uh gosh i mean it was just littered with talent ronnie brown was on that team you had jason williams at quarterback but i had an opportunity i, I got to meet cadillac in the locker room and he could not have been nicer i, I was you know a nobody i was just a 17 year old kid on a, a unofficial visit um, had driven down uh, to Auburn to take in that game. And uh, he signed the game program for me and shook my hand. And I mean, this was after the game. I mean, he, he didn't have to, to do that, but that left a, a, a real impression on me as the kind of person that coach Cadillac Williams is. And you saw how that has carried over to his professional career that atmosphere i feel like had to have something to do with one of auburn's own in coach cadillac williams coming into his own you saw it where all of his former teammates were there celebrating with him you got cole kubelik mentioned he had millionaires on the field that had played in the nfl for years jason williams and they were there to support their guy cadillac williams i wanted one of his players to talk about what did that game mean uh, for for you, ha having been a part of a, a unit that ended up, obviously, you're the, the kicking unit was what was the deciding factor in the game to win and to win not only for you and for your team, but also for Coach Cadillac Williams. Uh, talk to me about him and just the Auburn family and that, that, that atmosphere, because it, it looked incredible. Cadillac loves to say, if you love Auburn, Auburn will love you back. And that's 100% true. Um, I think when 
Coach Harson was released. Uh, Cadillac was surprised, genuinely surprised to be the interim head coach. He he looked. He tells us all the time that it's it was never his dream to to be the head coach, but he's going to do the best job he can to to not only coach but to to lead men. And and Cadillac, like you said, is um, he's Auburn grown and Auburn loves family. Auburn is a family, and um, you know, last week against Mississippi State, obviously it didn't go well, but I think everybody saw just how how exciting Auburn football can be. Um, you know, we hadn't played well this year, but um, you know, against Mississippi State and then against Texas A&M, we we fought for Auburn. We did, you know, honestly, we fought for Auburn. And we were trying to play good, hard-nosed football. And that's what Cadillac preached the last two weeks. And he is – he's a guy you – it's impossible not to love him. The energy he brings each and every day, the love he shows to all of us players. And, you know, I think you could see it on his face, pregame, postgame, during the game. He's just – he's excited. He loves Auburn, and Auburn is loving each and every one of us because we're fighting for more than us. We're fighting for Auburn. And it was an incredible atmosphere. And honestly, between two, three, and six teams, we should have never had an atmosphere like that. But Auburn showed up for one of Auburn's own. Um, and you see players, like you said, you named all the players from the 2014 team and that, that were all on the sideline. We probably had 30 or 40 players, former players, you know, supporting Cadillac from in the locker room pregame to um, on the field for every minute of that game. Um, you saw guys like Carlos Rogers just hanging out with Cadillac's kids um, in the locker room after the game because um, they were excited to see him and he was excited to be back. You saw guys like Ronnie Brown who works for, you know, the Auburn Sports Network and, um in, you know, sideline reporting, just he's on the sideline going up and down um, just with a smile on his face as we're all jumping around being excited to play football. Um, and just having those guys behind us to support us uh, was a huge deal to all of us, as well as the fans that showed up for from Tiger Walk two hours before the game to the final whistle when we go and jump around with the student section. It was uh, an atmosphere that probably shouldn't have been like that, um, but we, uh, we, we took advantage of it. We, we went with it. Um, A&M was a good team as well. They've lost, I think, five games by one score this year. So A&M, despite what their record says, is a really good team. And I'm, I'm just glad we had the crowd there to back us up as we played them. With this newfound momentum and playing for each other, you've now positioned yourselves to where postseason is a, a realistic opportunity. What is next for Auburn for both this year and moving forward as you've now positioned yourself, if you were to win out, to to experience postseason football? Uh, do, do, you, do you expect – uh, this to be a launching point and, and maybe not necessarily for postseason aspirations for this year, but do you expect this game and that atmosphere to be a launching point for the continued success into next year? I hope it is. You know, we got to focus on Western Kentucky next. We can't, Western Kentucky is a good team this upcoming week and we can't, we can't look over them, but obviously after them's Alabama and that's a, always a big game each and every year. And then if we make the postseason, you know, Hey, that means we're on a three-game winning streak going into the postseason. Have momentum going into the offseason. Um, it's a uh, it's it's a big deal to have the crowd behind us like it was this past week and be able to showcase who Auburn is and who and that Auburn's just being Auburn with uh, with the love and support we we have and just you know fighting each and every day to be the best people we can be, um, playing good hard-nosed football and showcasing just who we are as a, as a team and um, whoever the next coach is is taking on guys who are willing to fight for this place. Right. And, and, and I mean, this is not the platform for me to speculate or to ask you, you know, your thoughts on that situation. Obviously when, when a decision is made, whether that's, you know, if, 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 
Cadillac Williams is named the permanent head coach or whoever the next guy is going to be. There, there are other talking heads that they can get into that. Um, obviously, you know, we we're hopeful for you know the the success of the Auburn program and and for you uh, both on the field next year as well as after football and whoever whether it's Cadillac or, or somebody else, whoever is named the the head coach for next season will obviously have an impact on on both your football life as well as your life after football. So I did want to make sure that I asked you about your intentions for post football, whenever that may be, whether it's after next year or after you're fortunate enough to possibly play professionally. I know you've got the engineering uh, major, and then you said that you were also getting your master's, and I think you said business administration. Uh, do you have an idea, Jacob, of what you are looking to get into professionally? I have a very general idea. So i I have an internship lined up for next summer with an engineering company, and I would love to, you know, serve as a um, as a key role for whoever that may be an engineering firm on the business side of things. Um, but also I love sports. And so kind of that, my plan a is, you know, engineering business, that kind of stuff. And plan B is something in the sports industry, whether that be business or Auburn coming back to Auburn and, um, doing what I can here or whatever that path may lead. I kind of have a plan a plan B type of scenario. And, um, yeah, I'm going to use those degrees because I didn't I didn't come to Auburn just to play football. I came here to get an education and then um, to use that education and um, the next steps moving forward and um, hopefully be successful in whatever I do. Jacob, as we're winding down here, I, I wanted to pause for a moment and I wanted to ask you as somebody who has gone through it and had to earn everything that they have achieved up to this point, what would be your words of advice or words of encouragement to a, a young high school player who is looking to play at the next level, who may not be getting the notoriety that they feel they deserve? Uh, do you have any advice or words of encouragement for that young athlete, male or female, in their respective sport um, as, as far as the walk-on process or what it means to be a walk-on? Uh, I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Uh, if you're going through that process or, you know, you, you know whatever it may be, um, just put your head down and keep working. I was a guy that didn't really – I'm not a big vocal guy with the team. I just – I'm more of a quiet guy that goes about his business and does things the right way. If you do things the right way and you you do that work, or here at Auburn we like to say we put in the work, the hard work, um, you know, if you just keep fighting and keep working and keep pushing yourself to be the best player – and best person you can be, whether that be academics, whether that be athletically, whether that be character building, push yourself to be the best person you can be and the best athlete you can be, and things will work out for you. Um, it might not always look, you know, might not always be the most fun or might not always look the best or whatever it may be, um, but just keep pushing and it'll work out. Fantastic. Jacob, I can't thank you enough for your time. You've been so gracious. Thank you for entertaining some of the, the more detailed specifics of what it is that you do on a football field. And I wanted, before we completely sign off, uh, for those who don't know, we always have our guests sign off with their school's rallying cry at Auburn. I know what that one is. I don't even have to ask. I want you to give me your best war eagle you have ever given right now war eagle hey fantastic jacob thank you so very much best of luck to you both the rest of this season as well as you heard it here for next season using his covid year for a sixth year of eligibility we can't wait to see what's in store for you next thank you very much and god bless you yeah, I appreciate it. War Eagle. Great stuff there from Jacob. Again, we want to thank him for his time and for his continued success this season as well as next at Auburn. For our listeners out there, please go and follow him. He is on Twitter at Jacob underscore Q-Bomb. That is Q-B-A-U-M-50. 
and that is on Twitter. Uh, for those who are not currently following our show, we are at WO Perspective on Twitter. You can find us at Walk On Perspective on both Facebook and Instagram. Again, my name is Robert Boswell. I am your host. If you have questions, feedback, I encourage you email me at robert at walkonperspective.com. If you have enjoyed today's episode, I encourage you to please rate and review on whatever platform you're currently listening on. We are on Twitter, or excuse me, we are on Apple, Google, Spotify, iHeartRadio, as well as YouTube. Please go and subscribe to our YouTube page so that you can be updated on when we have the newest video content available to you. And again, our show is being brought to you today by Walk On Wellness. So for those of you who are looking to improve body composition, improve your energy levels, overall performance, to be able to keep up with your kids and do so without crazy restrictive diets and endless hours on the treadmill, I want you to email me, robert at walkonperspective.com or direct message me on any of the social media platforms I mentioned above. And let's see if I can help you by putting together an individualized and personalized nutrition protocol and exercise programming. Thank you to each and every one of you and God bless.